Welcome everyone. Uh, this is the Rotary Club of Toronto and I am Prince Kumar, uh, your club's president. Uh, it is now time for the main segment of our meeting and I will continue on with the recognition of traditional lands, the invocation, uh, a special rendition of O Canada and have your glasses ready following that for a toast. At this time, I would like to acknowledge that we're on the traditional lands of many Indigenous peoples who have walked and cared for this land for 15,000 years. They include the Anishinaabe, the Haudenosaunee, the Huron-Wendat, and the Treaty Peoples of the Mississauga Credit. As we meet together in Rotary Fellowship, may we commit ourselves again to Rotary's four-way test. Is it the truth? Is it fair? To all concern? Will it build goodwill and better friendships? Will it be beneficial to all concerned? We give thanks for the opportunities to improve our world through our professions and through Rotary service. As we enjoy today's environmentally focused meeting, may we ever be mindful of the needs of others and our planet. Thank you. And now, for a very special O Canada, with special permission by a Grammy Award winner, US Billboard number one artist, music compo composer, and environmentalist, Ricky Cage. The House of Commons Parliament of Canada awarded Ricky for his outstanding musical <laughs> and humanitarian achievement. His version of O Canada is dedicated to the natural world of Canada. We will now play his rendition of Okan. Oh, I can read more. Or this not a meeting. Oh. And if you okay, would like, F please stand for O Canada following a special toast. Rotarians and guests, a special toast to Rotary. Please be seated. Rotarians and guests, it is now my pleasure to present our head table. For our head table today, we have the following people with me today. June Brown. Rotarian since 2010. Classification, storyteller. Professional storyteller and our how we hobby speaker in the members exclusive segment today. You heard June and what you don't know is she has a heart of gold. And if you ever get a chance to visit Alex and June's place, I highly, highly recommend it. Vichar Godarzi, Rotarian since 2016. Classification, real estate residential. Real estate broker with Remax. Hallmark Realty Limited Broker. Our lead 
on the member exclusive How We Hobby segment. And in an in-person meetings, she's usually the first one to welcome you back. So when we do go back to in-person meetings, I'm looking forward to that future. Kurt Croson, Retarian since 2013, classification retired, club treasurer and liaison director for International Service Committee, past co-chair of our Environmental Services Committee. And now I have worked with Kurt on various different committees, our board and the executive, and it's a pleasure to see Kurt come up with some wonderful questions that really empower and engage everyone. Thank you, Kurt. Mark McQuitty, Retarian since 2020, classification, social impact investment, CEO of Windsor Park Capital Corp, member of our previous environmental services committee. And as a fairly new member, Mark has gotten engaged and has already started to make a huge impact in the community. Thank you, Mark. And our guests for today, Victoria Badum, Education and Outreach Manager from Toronto Wildlife Centre, who you'll hear from shortly. Bert Steinberg, Rotarian since 1994, Classification, Property Management, Principal, Stone Fortress, Club Past President, and our host to our guest speaker. And if you folks go to Scoogog, you certainly want to be on Bert's good side. And also remember, he plays a wicked guitar. Richard White, Rotarian since 1996, classification employee benefits consultant, vice president of Nike Research Financial Services Inc., past club and past foundation president, one of our guest speakers for today. And you'll hear a lot more about Richard, but I do have to thank him for endless hours on the transition team. Keelan White, fellow canoeist, and Richard Sun, our other guest speaker, who you'll hear about shortly. Rotarians and guests. For our virtual meetings, we do not have an official monitor to introduce the visiting Rotarians and guests, so I will proceed. I do see we have guests coming in from Toronto Wildlife Centre, so welcome. And I do see uh, a few guests coming in from outside. So to, to our guests and Rotarians, a special welcome. And to our visiting Rotarians, thank you for choosing our club, for your makeup, and we hope that you enjoy your meeting. To all our guests, welcome to our virtual meeting today. Please feel free to contact the office and find out more about how you can make a difference in joining us. And if you like, go to our website and click on the Join Us form, and our member engagement committee will be happy to assist you. Rotarians, please welcome our visitors in the tradition of our great club. Now, we do repeat this every week, but I think it's important to continue on with this particular announcement. You should be aware that at these virtual Rotary meetings, that if you have your video camera on, that you may show up on the recordings or on our social media, if we put it up on social media. We ask that when you have your camera on, that you present a professional image, have your lunch earlier, please, and be aware of what is going on in your background when your camera is on. If you do not want to appear, on the video, please turn off your video and we will not be able to edit you out later. I will continue on with some other announcements. For Toronto Rotarians only, we will be having a cautionary slow start up, a slow start up to our hybrid lunches. Hybrid, meaning there is a combined physical lunch and a virtual element at the same time. So as things start to open up, starting with Friday, August 6th, we are piloting a hybrid lunch at the National Club. We will have a very limited capacity. And the limited capacity, is, as I said, we're, we're being cautionary, so is, is even a smaller percentage based on what's actually allowed today. So it will likely be about 20 to 30 attend attendees, which, can, which is based on our current event capacity restrictions and further, our board wanting to take things slow and be cautionary, which is excellent. Please watch for an email from Carol on how we will be able to implement this pilot project and hybrid meeting. 
our second announcement. Now, this relates to the hybrid meetings. Our new lunch plan options are changing, and there will be further information coming to all Rotarians, Rotaractors, and guests regarding what your new lunch plan pricing options are, which will be available for your consideration, whether you'd like to attend physical lunch meetings or perhaps hybrid meetings going forward. Feel free to contact Carol once you've received the details from her and discuss on a one on one basis anytime any of these options that will be presented to you. Once again, you saw our third announcement. Once again, you saw the link tree page that went up. We have one specific link that you can use to invite guests to follow our social media to watch previous meetings, and it's simply link tree slash Rotary Toronto. Up next, we have a special element that we have introduced, and that is our impact reporting uh, segment. So what does that mean? Throughout the course of the year, our club and the foundation gives out several grants, and we are thrilled to invite some of the grantees to our Friday lunches to tell us a little bit about their organization and what has the impact been of such a grant. Today, I'm pleased to welcome Victoria Bada, Education and Outreach Manager of the Toronto Wildlife Centre. Now, Victoria joined the Toronto Wildlife Hotline in 2011. Responding to thousands of calls made her aware of the issues affecting urban wildlife and the urgent need for broader public education. Today, she heads the Toronto Wildlife Centre's hotline and education and outreach programs with the aim to inspire children, youth and adults to respect and connect with the amazing wild species with whom we share our neighbourhoods. This was a grant given in partnership with our previous Environmental Services Committee. Victoria, over to you. Thank you so much for inviting me here today to share the important work that we're doing here at Toronto Wildlife Centre. Next slide, please. Just to give you a bit of history on our organization, we have been open every single day since 1993, including weekends and all holidays. We admit approximately 5,000 sick, injured and orphaned wild animals every single year from over 300 different species. Our wildlife hotline handles approximately 40,000 calls from members of the public every single year, everything from wildlife emergencies to just general inquiries about wildlife. Through our education program, we reach up to 5,000 people each year and thousands more through our extra communications that we put out, such as social media. We are a, a nonprofit, we are a charity, and we run primarily on donations, and we are the only wildlife hospital in the entire city of Toronto. Next si slide, please. With the generous support of the Rotary Club of Toronto, we were able to build a new outdoor flight cage at Rouge National Urban Park, which will be the new site um, where we're establishing a new permanent home. We admit dozens of bats every single year. Some have come out of hibernation too early and they have to spend the entire winter with us at Toronto Wildlife Centre. Others are admitted because they are injured. So they may have flown into a window or have been attacked by a cat and they're treated for head wounds, head trauma, wounds and punctures. And some even have to undergo surgery. And they also have to be hand fed individually mealworms by our staff so they can be quite work intensive. Next slide, please. Once our patients have healed and when the weather is warm enough, we provide the critical last step in their rehabilitation. Thanks to your support, patients will be placed in our new flight cage where they'll have the opportunity to get outside, build up some stamina, their muscles and their energy, and practice important skills such as uh, hunting for insects that are live and flying around in the flight cage. Next slide, please. Your support is also helping us to construct a new outdoor enclosure for sick and injured water birds. 
So some water birds, we receive hundreds of them every year, come in completely entangled in fishing line, or some have even swallowed fishing hooks. This is a very common thing. We also admit a lot of orphaned water birds, such as these little mallards that have become separated from their parents, or sometimes a parent is hit by a car. Sometimes we're unsure of how the animal actually sustained the injury, like this least bittern, which is a species at risk. It was admitted with an injured foot and had to be in our care for 57 days before we were able to release it back out into the wild, which is the ultimate goal for all of our patients. Next slide, please. These animals need a safe place to grow up healthy and strong and heal. After being indoors for treatment and recovery, they need to spend some time outside to get some fresh air and get used to the weather again. They also practice swimming and foraging and they develop their waterproofing in their feathers to keep them warm and dry. Funding from the Rotary Club of Toronto is ensuring that these birds have a very safe space to heal until they go back out into the wild. Next slide, please. If you're interested in learning more about Toronto Wildlife Centre and the work we do, please visit our website at torontowildlifecentre.com or visit one of our social media pages. We're on Facebook, Instagram and Twitter. Thanks so much for taking the time to learn more about we do, what we do. Thank you so much for your support and back to Prince. Thank you, Victoria. And thank you for all that you're doing for our wildlife. It is now time in continuing on with this special uh, meeting uh, with wildlife, with, with our nature, to introduce our guest speaker. And I would like to pass things over to our host, past president, Bert Steenberg. Over to you, Bert. Thank you, Mr. President. Of course, Richard White really requires no introduction to this club. He is known to most of you and has been an engaged member for a long time. But perhaps I can just briefly introduce his presentation. For some years now, Richard and I have met for an hour or so every Monday morning at 8 a.m. sharp. We, meet over, we met over breakfast at the National Club before COVID and on the phone since. We are both news hounds and much of our discussion forms around the news of the day and how we think the world should be run. If you were a fly on the wall during our get togethers, I wouldn't be surprised if an image of those two old codgers from the Muppets would come into your mind as you listen in. Over the years, however, it is a rare day when we don't talk about Richard's love for paddling the waters and lugging a canoe around our great province. His passion for canoeing started when he was a boy. I know he now shares this passion with all of his adult children. And some of his closest friends are the guys he has camped and canoed with over many years. When the program committee talked about wanting to bring a flavor of how our members spend their summers to our July and August meetings, Richard's life of canoeing and portaging came to mind immediately. And the committee enthusiastically supported the idea to ask him to present. I am so thankful that he and his son Keelan agreed to prepare this presentation for us I know they've worked hard to bring us something which might inspire others to share their passion. Enough from me, over to you, Richard. Well, thank you, Bert, for that kind introduction. It, it, uh, I always brace myself when you introduce somebody <laughs> just to see what's exactly gonna happen. But anyway, thank you very much. Uh, and maybe on to the second slide. Uh, John Muir, a Scottish-American naturalist advocating for the American National Park System in the late 1880s, perhaps said it best, everybody needs beauty as well as bread, places to play in and pray in, where nature may heal and give strength to body and soul. Most of us benefit from some contact with nature. For some, it may be a simply a walk in a city park. Others crave a deeper connection to get into the backcountry for several days where you're on your own with nothing but the wind in the trees, water lapping the shore, and clear nights with billions of twinkling stars overhead. When immersed in nature, the cares of the world, modern world slip away. No meetings to rush to, no deadlines to meet, no bills to pay. The tension drains away with each step or paddle stroke. Life is simpler and slower. You live close to the land. What could be better than greeting the sunrise perched on a rock with a cup of coffee in hand? 
Until recently, nature seemed indestructible and infinite and was something to be tamed and exploited, cutting timber, mining, fishing, building dams. We are coming to value the fact that Canada has 20% of the world's fresh water, that the forests and wetlands clean our air and water, that the flora and fauna have a value that needs to be preserved and nourished if we are to survive. The indigenous peoples around the world have much to teach us about the stewardship of nature upon which we all depend. Let us hope we can learn to work together and that we aren't too late. My introduction to nature came at age five when my father purchased a 100-acre farm, which had been abandoned since the Depression years. It was a poor farm, littered with gravel and many small round rocks left there by the retreating glaciers. But it was rich in recreational natural value with a 23-acre hardwood bush and the soggy river which flowed across the property. My parents rescued and refurbished the abandoned long house built in 1860. We are blessed in Canada with some of the world's most spectacular countryside, mountains, prairies, Canadian shield. The waterways were the highways into the interior and the canoe was the main mode of travel starting with the early exploration and the fur trade. Like many of you, I attended summer camp starting at age 12. I was fortunate to go to a small camp, <coughs> excuse me, located across Penn Lake from Deerhurst Lodge, which had an excellent canoeing program. Part of each year's camp <clears throat> was a short canoe trip into Algonquin Park. My eyes were really open to the possibilities with a three-week canoe trip out of Camp Tomogamy. Later, as a senior counselor, I led canoe trips to my old camp. I was fortunate to find a group of five other kindred spirits, and we had done a canoe trip each year in various parts of Ontario since 1983. I became involved in Cubs and Scouts when my children were of age and was privileged to introduce many of them to canoe tripping. I am proud to say that all three of my children have caught the canoeing and camping bug, and we are planning a one-week trip in a couple of weeks. I would now like to introduce my oldest son, Keelan, who has put together this PowerPoint presentation. Uh, he is a graduate uh, mechanical engineer uh, from McMaster uh, and works for a tan light um, a lighting company, but he really does not uh, work, uh, live to work, he works to live. And he's had ex extensive experience in scouting, first aid and lifeguard training, and has just completed a five-day course in whitewater canoeing with the Madawaska Canoe School. He is happiest when he can hop in a canoe and head out for several days with his dog, Kaharu, and his camera. He's going to give you a nuts and bolts look at what is involved in canoe tripping. Over to you, Keelan. Thank you very much. Uh, you can flip to the next slide, please. Fantastic. So as, as a general introduction for, for a lot of backcountry stuff, the, the first thing that I would ensure or, uh, encourage all of you to uh, explore is the use of an outfitter, uh, especially if you're looking at parks like Algonquin or Killarney. Uh, there are several outfitters attached to each park, um, and these guys and, and ladies know the backcountry of those areas very, very well. Um, they'll be able to help you plan an appropriate route associated with your uh, specific uh, competencies and how much gear you may or may not have, um, and, as well as be able to rent you and sell you the equipment if, if you need to. In a lot of cases, if you're coming out of Toronto uh, specifically, and if you don't have a lot of your own gear yourself, they can also drop a lot of the stuff at your various access points. Uh, so a lot of these um, outfitters are, are located on major highway accesses to the parks, uh, such as Killarney Outfitters just outside of the town of Killarney. Um, Algonquin Outfitters have several locations uh, in Huntsville as well as um, uh, up Highway 11. Uh, and they can help you with virtually everything uh, involved with planning your trip. Uh, they can also provide shuttle and logistics assistance, depending on how you may or may not require that. The one thing that I would suggest that you purchase um, is a map of the area that you'll be visiting. Um, in many cases, the park maps are available for park map or popular parks. Um, and if they aren't, if you're planning on going off the beaten path to, uh, to further and more remote areas, I would encourage you to get a topographic map, which you can order through uh, various services for all of Canada. Uh, next slide. So the biggest element with backcountry canoeing, which is one of the more popular activities within Canada, is the, the element of portaging. So portaging involves picking up all of your gear, throwing it over a shoulder and walking it from one water body to the next water body. Um, 
all your gear should be packed in backpacks for for easy carrying. I've seen lots of people that have attempted to do it with coolers on wheels and various other paraphernalia like duffel bags, and it it is considerably simpler if you have it in a backpack. If you are going to do multiple carries per portage, so if you're if you're packing heavy, if you want to go in and you're you're enjoying uh, kind of the luxuries in the backcountry. Ensure that you're um, creating a route that makes sense for how much stuff you have. So if you're doing multiple carries, uh, the first carry is going to be one times the distance of the, the portage length. So let's say your portage is a kilometer. You're going to be walking all your stuff one kilometer. However, if you're going to be doing it a second time, you have to walk back as well as there again, which means you're doing three kilometers worth of walking. All that stuff takes time. And this is what an outfitter can help you in terms of planning how and where you're going to get from point A to point B. The thing that I will recommend is that plan a route within your means. I have run into a number of groups over the years uh, where they expected to be able to go 30 or 40 kilometers in a day when they're portaging things three times each time. And the, you know, the sun's setting, they haven't eaten dinner, people are grumpy and they've still got another 10 kilometers to go before they get to their campsite. Uh, and that's, uh, that's not a situation that anybody will enjoy. Next slide. All right, so this is a graphic uh, for, for those of you that have explored some of this stuff uh, from a company called Jeff's Maps. Uh, and I thought it was a really good indication as to kind of how fast you may or may not be able to cover distance. So if you're a first timer, if this is the first time you're heading into the back country, you don't have a lot of experience, maybe you're following somebody that does have a little bit of experience or you're just striking off on your own with the help of an outfitter, you can usually assume that you'll be able to cover about two kilometers an hour. That's an average and you'll be able to move faster or slower, but that takes into account things like weather related delays, uh, delays in terms of portaging and um, as well as paddling skill. Uh, if you've done a little bit more uh, backcountry camping and you're a little bit more familiar with the, the nuts and bolts of it, you might be able to get that up to three kilometers an hour. And then if you run into people in the backcountry that have been doing this for years, like my father, I mean, he'll be moving at four kilometers an hour or, or more with his guys. So, uh, Next slide. All right, so knowing the risks associated with backcountry, um, the, the two main types of water are flat water and white water. So flat water, which consists of lakes or low current areas of rivers, um, you'll see in kind of like marshy areas and stuff like that. Uh, big lakes can get very windy with big waves. Uh, the, the major lake in, in Algonquin Park is called Opiongo and it's enormous and it's quite famous for uh, having huge waves when the wind really picks up, something like three to four foot rollers type of thing. Those can very easily swamp a canoe, uh, especially if you're not kind of paying attention. Uh, so those are risks that you kind of need to be aware of in terms of how you're packing, in terms of reading what's in front of you uh, to be able to make the call as to whether or not you actually venture out on that day or in that direction. Um, it also means that your campsites on those types of lakes can be very exposed to weather. So if you've got a huge storm system moving in, uh, you may want to look for sites that are in protected bays or, or in other kind of protected areas around headlands and stuff like that. White water, by comparison, is very dangerous just from the moving water standpoint. So the amount of water pressure that uh, a river can actually exert on an object in that river uh, can be quite considerable. Uh, and this can be very dangerous if you get pinned. So if you fall out of your canoe um, uh, or your kayak and you end up between the canoe and a rock, uh, it can be very dangerous for your health. Um, it can also carry your gear a very long distance if you flip. Uh, I just recently finished a trip uh, the last fall uh, where the partners that we were with uh, flipped their canoe and we actually never recovered one of their backpacks because they all ended up kilometers downstream. Whitewater uh, requires a lot of skill and coordination between partners in your canoe and it can require special gear. The reason I bring this up is that if this is your first time into the backcountry, just because uh, rivers look like smaller water bodies and they've got some current to them which would make trans uh, or uh, traveling on them easier, they do come with their own set of risks and flat water typically is is less risky from an, an introduction standpoint. Next slide. So if you are talking to an outfitter, they will likely ask whether you're going for flat water or white water as an initial uh, kind of question for you if you're renting a canoe. So uh, canoes kind of come in two basic flavors. You've got Canoes that are good for tracking, which have little to no rocker. Rocker is the shape of the bottom of the boat. So you'll see in that first image there, uh, the um, bottom of the boat is quite flat all the way across. This means that it'll go in a straight line very easily without having to work really hard against it. 
However, uh, it does mean that it's not going to be nearly as maneuverable. So if you're dealing with small currents or small rivers, uh, it won't change direction particularly quickly, which is great for crossing a lake. However, if you go for a moderate to an extreme rocker, which you see in the second image with a much more curved bottom, uh, you get a lot more maneuverability, but a lot less tracking. So it's great for whitewater or smaller creeks and rivers and stuff like that, uh, but you sacrifice the, uh, the amount of effort it takes to go straight. Next slide. All right, so food is probably one of the biggest concerns when it comes to camping, and certain, especially in terms of how it'll affect your trip. So spoilage is the first issue to take into account. So most parks don't allow for cans or glass containers to be brought into them. Uh, this is simply by virtue of the fact that uh, most cans end up getting left inside the backcountry and they, they don't degrade over time. And glass containers can break and shatter and cause uh, um, issues for both wildlife and, and future campers. Uh, that said, it is best to choose shelf stable or dry goods to bring into the backcountry. So things like pastas or rice. Um, because they will last forever throughout the course of the trip. Uh, you want to especially avoid raw meats, especially grinds, uh, because they will spoil very quickly, as well as fresh dairy. Um, it is, in my estimation, next to impossible to bring in a cooler for any length of time for most backcountry trips. So having things that require um, refrigeration or, or just being in a cooler and expecting them to last uh, is setting yourself up for food poisoning. Um, you also want to base your meals on how long your trip is. Um, one of my staple meals, especially for the first night on a trip, uh, is steak. We freeze the steaks ahead of time and we take them up with us. And by the time they've unthawed, we're usually into camp the first night and the steak is fantastic. Uh, that said, you wouldn't want to take um, uh, raw chicken for that night because it will spoil in that uh, amount of time. Uh, and you want to make sure that whatever meals you are bringing will last for the length of time until you end up eating them. So the second consideration with food is storage of that food. Um, you're not the only ones in the backcountry. There's lots of little critters that uh, are actually there first. Uh, so your food needs to be animal proofed in that respect. Uh, the most common ways of doing that in southern Ontario are to be hanging it in a tree, uh, which are typically called bear bags, um, uh, or inside an animal proof container uh, or a bear barrel. Uh, you typically want to keep your food probably about 100 meters away from your camp so that anything that does attract animals uh, won't be attracting them through your camp. Uh, there's nothing worse than having a bear decide that it wants to uh, take a pathway through your campsite in the middle of the night. Uh, you also never want to store food or scented items in your tent for the same reason. Um, uh, chipmunks and red squirrels are excellent at chewing through small elements of fabric, which both leaves you with a hole in your tent, as well as uh, critters inside your tent, which is <laughs> never fun. Uh, disposal. So after you've finished a meal, especially if there's leftovers, um, the, uh, the leftovers or, or remaining food should either be burned completely uh, over like in a very hot fire uh, so that you get rid of it in, in its entirety or buried. Um, now, bury, if you are burying it, it's not just a matter of, you know, scraping a little bit of dirt off the ground and then putting it in a hole. You want it probably about a foot deep or 30 centimeters, and you want it to be probably about 60 meters away from a water source. This means is, as it degrades over time, it's not going to spoil any of those uh, water sources in the area, and it also won't attract animals as it, uh, as it starts to rot. You also want to pack out any non-burnable garbage. Um, so if you've got uh, elements of packaging that have come with the food that you've brought, you want to make sure that you're taking them back out of the park and not just leaving them around. Next slide. In terms of cooking your food, um, st backcountry stoves kind of come in three different types. Uh, the one on the left that you see is a gas stove, so it takes naphtha gas or white gas. Uh, and there's a number of different types of these on the market. Um, major manufacturers of them are MSR and Optimus. And you can find them at most uh, retailers um, that are dedicated to backcountry stuff like Mac or Canadian Tire. Um, in Europe, one of the more prevalent ways of doing it is with a uh, wood or a stick stove. So this image here is actually one that I use on a regular basis. Uh, and it actually just burns wood. So it means that you don't have to carry a fuel source around with you. You can typically cut hard uh, dry wood out of the forest around you when you're in camp. Um, so it makes the, the fuel source a lot easier to obtain. Um, but it does require that you know how to start a fire and, and can do that on a regular basis. Uh, the last type is an alcohol stove. So an alcohol stove, which you see is the, the little burner in the middle there, uh, are uh, preferable for a lot of backpackers because they're very lightweight. Uh, that said, they do typically take longer to boil water uh, if you're, you're using them versus a wood stove or a gas stove just because the, uh, the energy density isn't quite as high. 
Next slide. All right, so some of the other aspects uh, with with camp cooking um, is cooking over an open fire. And for a lot of people, this will be either the way that they originally learned how to do it for, for camps, uh, or it's more of a back to basics type of strategy that is being re-employed in, in recent years. Uh, so this is an example of a reflector oven. So we actually do a fair amount of baking when we're in the back country. This was an apple pie that we made uh, for one night. Um, and if you're comfortable with how to set and, and tend a fire for cooking purposes, um, then these can make for some fantastic meals in the backcountry, either fresh bread or fresh desserts. Uh, it really picks people up at the end of the day. Next slide. And then the other thing for backcountry cooking over an open fire would be the use of a grill. Uh, so this is one of the grills that I, I use and take with us on a number of trips. Uh, and this allows you to uh, either cook meat directly over an open fire, if you say got fish or, or steaks, uh, or balance a pot over it for boiling water and rehydrating stews and stuff like that. Next slide. All right, so essential items, water. Uh, as uh, as my father mentioned, we've got 20% of the world's fresh water in Canada. So it kind of seems like it's a bit ubiquitous in that respect. However, uh, water, especially when you're canoe tripping and close to uh, major city centers um, in Southern Ontario, does require treatment. Uh, so there are bacteria in the waters um, and viruses that can harm you. Um, Things like Giardia are, are not a whole lot of fun. Um, so from a purification standpoint, uh, the generally acceptable uh, method of purifying your water is to boil it for one minute. Uh, and you want a rolling boil for that whole minute. At that point in time, nothing from a pathogen standpoint will exist any longer and you can drink that water. You'll want to, however, cool it off before you do so, uh, which is why it's not as prevalent in this day and age as a purification source. However, it is still one of the most ubiquitous ways of doing it, especially if you don't have any other um, methods of purification in the backcountry. Uh, the other item that's often uh, found in things like first aid kits or emergency kits are iodine tablets. So you'll actually put this in the water after you've uh, put it into a, a container of some description, and the iodine will kill off any pathogens in the water. Uh, pump filters uh, were also a, a big use um, up until kind of recently when gravity filters took a little bit more of a prevalence. Uh, this allows you to, uh, with the use of a hand pump, force water through a small ceramic filter uh, that filters out any of the pathogens in the water. So you can use it kind of anywhere at any time, which is quite useful. Gravity filters, which came on the market probably about 10 years or so ago, um, means that you don't have to put any uh, personal effort into it. You did actually just fill up a bag full of water and then you let the gravity pull the water through a filter and into a clean reservoir. Uh, this makes it a lot easier, especially for large groups because uh, you can hang a large reservoir in the tree and then gravity does all the work for you as you go about and set up camp. Next slide. Shelter. So shelter is the most important aspect that you need to consider when you are in the back country. So the, the basis of this is a good tent. You want a waterproof bottom and a sealed fly, uh, as well as a tarp. So a tarp uh, you typically use as your kitchen setup uh, or just generally hanging out in camp. And you want it sized for your group. Uh, the more rope attachment points that you have on the, the tarp, the better, because it allows you to uh, string it up in a whole bunch of different ways, dependent on the terrain that you happen to be in. Uh, the other thing that you want to uh, potentially take into account if the, the weather is not looking so great is choosing a sheltered site where appropriate. Um, so in, in some cases, uh, if you know you're due for a really heavy storm or a thunderstorm or something along those lines, being in the lee of a headland or under the shelter of a lot of trees can really help in terms of your enjoyment of that experience. Exposure can kill you, so you want to make sure that you're prepared for all of this stuff. Um, in terms of being able to stay warm and dry out of the elements. Uh, because in a lot of cases, if you've been, let's say you've had a rough day on the water and you're cold and you're wet and this, that and the other, being able to change into dry clothes and then stay somewhere that is uh, um, protected from the elements can really improve your spirits as well as your, uh, your ability to uh, continue with the trip. Next slide. Uh, first aid kit. So, um, in addition to shelter, if, if if you run into any issues while you're on a trip, uh, first aid kits uh, being brought with you are, are instrumental from that standpoint. The first thing that I would say is go and take a course. Uh, make sure that you know what you're doing when it comes to standard first aid, uh, because even if you've got the greatest uh, first aid kit in the world, if you don't know how to use it, then you're, you're in trouble from that standpoint. 
most basic introductory courses are only two days um, and there are dedicated wilderness um, first aid courses uh, versus just standard first aid courses. Standard first aid courses assume that you've got professional help, kind of a phone call away, whereas wilderness first aid courses assume that help is going to be some time before it gets to you. And in some cases, if you're in the back country for uh, up to a week at a time, help might be several hours to a several days away. Uh, which means you need to stabilize people's injuries and, and stuff like that. Uh, you also want to be familiar with what's in your first aid kit. So don't just buy something off the shelf and assume that it's going to have everything that you need. Actually pop it open and make sure that you know what's in there. Um, one of the things that's never included with an off the shelf first aid kit is drugs. Uh, so you definitely want to make sure that you pack these things in separately because they're never included. Uh, things like ibuprofen or Advil um, is very useful in terms of reducing fever and inflammation as well as uh, pain medication. Benadryl as well. Um, my father's got a fantastic story from the Des Moines uh, number of years back uh, where they went, I want to say probably at the end of uh, May or early June, and the mosquitoes were terrible. Uh, and one of the members on his, his trip uh, got a really bad reaction from them. And the Benadryl was actually the one thing that kind of saved his bacon on that, uh, that trip. Uh, so make sure you take some of these things along with you, as well as any personal medication. Um, so if you have uh, medical conditions within the group that you're going with, you want to make sure that everybody is aware of those uh, um, medical conditions, as well as any medication that is required to help treat that person in the event of a, uh, an emergency. So, Next slide. Clothing. Uh, so you want to pack for all possible conditions, hot and cold weather, as well as rain. Um, this means that if, even if you're going in August, um, August in Algonquin, I mean, can get as low as single digits at night. Uh, so you want to make sure that you've got appropriate clothing associated with that. Uh, you want to dress in layers to allow for dressing up and dressing down as conditions change. So it might be cool in the morning when you get up, uh, in which case you want to have a couple of different layers on. And then as the day warms up and you're off uh, canoeing across the lake, you might be able to take a couple of those things off as the sun gets, uh, gets up in strength. You also want to pack separate in-camp clothes versus traveling clothes. Your traveling clothes will likely get wet, especially if you're canoeing, uh, not because you necessarily fall in, but because you're in and out of the canoe and you've got um, cortages that are muddy and stuff like that. So you want to expect kind of uh, having a set of traveling clothes that you don't really care about what happens to, as long as you've also got in-camp clothes to change into once you uh, get into camp in the evening. Uh, you always want to change out of wet or damp clothes at the end of the day uh, because the, the moisture being held next to your skin will actually reduce your core temperature, making you more susceptible to, uh, to injury. Uh, you also want to avoid cotton. So cotton holds moisture next to your skin and it's very heavy when it's wet, uh, which can um, lead to things like hypothermia, especially in cooler temperatures, uh, as well as just exhaustion from the standpoint that your body is constantly working to try to keep that water warm on top of just your body. So next slide. Sleeping. Uh, so you will have a terrible trip if you sleep terribly. I've taken a lot of uh, people that have been new to the back country, and if they don't have the uh, the right gear, their might right mindset, and they can't kind of get a good night's sleep out of it, they're they have a rough time the next morning. Uh, kind of the main things that you want within a, a sleep system, if you will, are a, a mattress. So a mattress insulates you from the ground temperature. So this is very important, especially if you're going in shoulder seasons where the ground is quite cool. Uh, it also helps to smooth out bumps and roots. So um, oddly enough, most of the backcountry isn't flat. Uh, so you'll want to have something that smooths out some of those irregularities in the ground. Uh, sleeping bags insulate you from the air temperature. So they don't do much against you versus the ground. That's where the mattress comes into place. But a sleeping bag will insulate you from the air temperature around you. Again, it's kind of season dependent. And you can choose different ratings on the different sleeping bags uh, to meet the various needs of the temperatures that you're going to go into. Uh, pillows are a bit of a luxury, um, and they can also vary from just a balled up sweatshirt, uh, which I've used for years, uh, to a dedicated inflatable pillow. There's lots of people that bring uh, almost like a travel pillow along with them uh, and swear by it because it gives them a nice comfortable sleep. Next slide. Uh, essential tools. So again, this is something that an outfitter can, can help you out with uh, a lot, uh, but you're going to want an axe, so a small pack axe or a hatchet. Uh, so that it can strap to the outside of a pack easily. And you're going to use this for uh, wood preparation, uh, splitting, um, as well as uh, limbing small trees and stuff like that, as well as just a nice heavy object if you need to you know, pound a tent stake into the ground or, or uh, knock something back into place. Uh, you also want a saw. So a saw is much more efficient when it comes to actually uh, collecting firewood, so a folding or a collapsible buck saw. 
Um, a knife, so a nice strong straight blade knife. You don't typically want a serrated knife because they're very difficult to sharpen. Uh, and then fire starters. So you're going to want a ferro rod, which works in all conditions, which is fantastic, or lighters or matches. Um, I, my personal preference is a ferro rod because you can never get it wet, uh, but lighters and matches are, are, are an excellent uh, alternative as well. Next slide. So a couple of essential skills that you'll kind of want to have uh, before stepping out into the backcountry. Uh, the first one is fire. So you want to learn and practice how to start and set a fire. I'm not going to go through all of the uh, the ins and outs of that right at the moment. There's lots of YouTube videos up on that. Uh, but being able to set a fire can uh, really assist if you've had a crummy day, especially if it's cold out, uh, and can actually save your life if the, uh, the weather makes a real turn for the worse. Um, However, with a fire, and especially in, in our current situation with the number of uh, wildfires burning in northern Ontario, you want to make sure that it's out and cold to the touch when you're finished with it. So that means dousing it with a lot of water uh, and making sure that you can actually put your hand directly on it uh, and, and that it's out before you leave that campsite or pack it in for the evening. Next slide. Uh, so the other skill is kind of reading the weather. Um, you want to keep an eye on the weather that you're, you're kind of paddling into. Uh, in terms of wind direction and strength. So winds can pick up in strength and change direction quite rapidly. And this can make uh, conditions very challenging uh, for a number of, uh, of especially new paddlers. Uh, you also want to keep an eye on the cloud types and the sky color so that you can witness whether or uh, expect as to whether or not a storm is coming over the horizon and potentially going to drench you with a lot of rain or really high winds. Uh, you also want to choose appropriate campsites based on that exposure so that you don't end up in a situation where you're uh, you're left exposed uh, to the elements from that standpoint. Next slide. And I'm going to pass this one back to Richard. Well, I don't want to say too much about this sort of thing. Uh, first of all, I, I wanted to perhaps mention that many things have changed since I first started canoe tripping. We used to drink the water right out of the lake. That was number one when I was, was younger. We also used to take cans of food and burn the empty cans in the fire and then sink them in the middle of the lake, which of course is not what we do now. Now we filter the water, there's a can and bottle ban. Uh, one thing that a lot of people um, uh, hear about is using biodegradable soap. Um, uh, a misnomer is that that just gives you free license to just jump in the lake and, and wash your hair and all that sort of thing. And well, where in fact, biodegradable soap only really works when uh, it's on land and, and, and the, it's the dumping it into the, onto the land and the, the microorganisms in the soil that actually make the biodegradable soap work the way it's supposed to. So just one of those little things um, to think about. We try and practice no trace camping. Uh, we try and burn what we can and pack out the rest. Uh, but it is up to all of us to help preserve and protect the Canadian wilderness. And we've got a terrific system of uh, provincial and national parks. And I'm going to leave you with a quote uh, from Chief Seattle, which says, take only memories and leave only footprints. Thanks. And back to you, Prince. Thank you, Richard and Keelan. Uh, and members, if you didn't catch it on the chat, uh, you can email questions. We do have a couple uh, already in there uh, to question at rotarytoronto.com. So it looks like, uh, and this, this can go to both you guys, uh, uh, our members want to find out, and, and I'll combine these two questions, is uh, given canoeing and portaging is, is also very much a bonding trip, you know, what if some interesting and uh, uh, well, interesting, challenging, and uh, funny experience has been uh, between the two of you as you've been canoeing and portaging. Why don't you take that one first, Galen? Oh, sure. Um, so one of the so with the guys that I typically go with, so I, I do a trip with a, a bunch of friends once a year. Uh, the first trip that I took them on. I didn't give them a whole lot of details as to what the nature of the route was going to be. Uh, and the first day out uh, involved two three kilometer portages over the mountain ranges in Killarney. Uh, so suffice to say, um, by the end of that day, they were both really hungry <laughs> and, 
and a little grumpy with me for not having told them about it at a time. Uh, they did make it into camp. We made it into camp by dinner time, so that was fantastic. But uh, you're uh, dealing with the various terrains as well as heavy loads makes for for an interesting day for all parties involved. Uh, I was going to say, uh, I hope we haven't scared people too much here. <laughs> um, but uh, as as I've gone through the years, uh, when when I was younger, it was all about how many how many miles can we cover in a day. And, and uh, uh, now it's uh, one one lake looks a lot like the next one. So what's the rush? Um, we do do rest days, um, which we all enjoy, and um, it really gives you a chance to kind of bond with. Uh, with uh, the, your surroundings and nature in general and, and each other, of course. Um, I was just gonna tell you about one trip we did in 1990. Uh, it was up in the Tomogamy area and um, we got a, a very bad uh, confluence of uh, high winds and really cold temperatures and uh, great big waves. And um, we all describe it as the trip from hell um, but anyway, we came home from that trip so exhausted that uh, I think we, well, we, some of us vowed never go back to Tomogamy again. I don't think that's really quite fair, but um, in any case. Um, they are still camping together, however. <laughs> yes, that's right. That's right. We're still camping together. So uh, anyway, it's just, a, it's just an amazing experience. Um, and I feel so fortunate to be able to, my children and also these friends of mine, uh, we're still wanting to do it, and uh, we, look, we look forward to our trips every year. So. Thank you. Uh, now, our next question is, uh, and, and this probably applies to me as well, uh, being an amateur and occasional uh, canoeist, is, uh, you know, what are your best defense mechanisms when it comes to uh, mosquitoes and uh, uh, deer flies or black flies? Buy a bug shirt. Don't, okay. don't go in, in, in uh, June and July. <laughs> so a, a bug shirt or a bug suit uh, is fantastic from that standpoint. So it'll go down to your uh, your wrists and keep a lot of the bugs off of your main part of your body. And they also have hoods built into them with mesh. So they'll keep the bugs out of your ears and out of your eyes, which is fantastic when you're uh, hauling heavy loads, loads along a portage. So uh, that said, um, as much as it has some controversy around it, uh, bug spray that contains DEET in it uh, is one of your best defenses if the bugs really take a liking to you. So, yeah, I have recently seen uh, uh, some areas uh, really coming down on DEET or, or DEET uh, bug sprays and really asking for DEET free. Yeah, uh, that's, that's always a challenge. Now, another question is: uh, uh, Can you expand on possible uh, snake uh, or I guess websites? Uh, around snake bites and how to find anti-venom uh, locations and sites? So uh, speaking from an Ontario perspective, we actually only have one venomous snake in Ontario, it's the Madawaska Rabs or um, Massasauga Rattler. Uh, and you typically only find it around the coast of Georgian Bay. Uh, it's actually quite rare um, and there is an anti-venom for it. Um, if you're dealing with venomous uh, snakes from, from that standpoint, uh, the biggest thing is to get help uh, as immediately as possible. So the anti-venom exists for the Massasauga Rattler. Uh, you just have to get to um, appropriate professional help. You typically have, I think the Massasauga Rattler, you actually have about two days before it can become a, um, uh, a life-threatening issue uh, in terms of the venom that's in it. Now, our next one comes from one of our newest members, uh, Naomi, is uh, being sort of, uh, uh, you know, new to camping, what can you suggest for easiest and safest trips close to Toronto when it involves a family? Um, you know, thoughts on renting canoes there, should it be a day trip near to Ottawa? What would you suggest to, to a family that, that wants to take it on but is really new to canoeing? So a number of the major parks uh, in southern Ontario, so uh, Killarney, which is up on Georgian Bay, Algonquin, which is right smack dab in the middle, uh, and more recently the Kawartha Highlands, which is just outside of Peterborough, uh, they all have easily accessible uh, both backcountry as well as front country or campground type sites, uh, and they're all very close to outfitters. So if you want to rent canoes and, and go for a day trip, everything is kind of right there and available for you. Um, so a lot of these places, even though they're, they're part of the Ontario Park system, um, they have a lot of very easily accessible and um, uh, introductory uh, 
type solutions for you. Uh, and our final question comes in around, uh, are there some interesting, uh, Ontario is filled with lakes, some really beautiful lakes. Um, are, are there one or two that come to mind in your uh, experiences uh, over the years? Uh, from a lake standpoint, I would have to say that one of my favorite experiences on a lake is actually Maple Lake in Algonquin Park. Um, it's up in the north end of Algonquin. You kind of have to come in through the, the North Bay route. Uh, but you take this really windy creek all the way up into Maple Lake. And once you get there, the creek actually seems to keep a lot of the riffraff out. So you usually have the place all to yourself. And it's it's absolutely gorgeous. I was just going to say, I think um, to add to that, Alg Algonquin Park is probably the best bet for this kind of tripping for people that aren't too experienced. Um, and you can you can chew off as much or as little as you want. Um, there are some beautiful lakes in there. I, I could probably name half a dozen uh, that aren't that far from um, or from the access point. Uh, but I think um, uh, plus Algonquin is is nicely set up. I mean the portages are well marked. The campsites are well marked. They have thunder boxes uh, on all the campsites, so you've you've got a little more comfort than you might have in in some of these other places. Um, and I and as Keelan says, the outfitters uh, are are well equipped. And uh, they'll uh, they'll give you some help with with all this stuff for sure. Okay, well, thank you, uh, Richard and Keelan. Uh, I can certainly speak for myself, and and I'm sure the rest of the members as well. Uh, this has been very informative, and I'm looking forward to going back to your presentation uh, to to take some of those pointers in my next uh, canoe trip. Uh, so thank you for joining us today. Um, I'm also reminded. Uh, today, not of the metaphorical, but the literal meaning of a beautiful poem by Robert Frost, uh, Stopping by the Woods on a Snowy Evening. And I'll read out a couple of verses uh, for you. Uh, Whose woods these are, I think I know. His house in the village, though, he will not see me stopping here to watch his woods fill up with snow. The woods are lovely, dark and deep, but I have promises to keep and miles to go before I sleep, and miles to go before I sleep. It's almost as though the poet is telling us about the beautiful backcountry that you've been sharing with us uh, in Canada, in Ontario. It sounds, it seems, and reminding us that our journey of exploration has just begun, be it in the city or in the wild landscape. Thank you so much, Richard and, and Keelan, for, for joining us and sharing that with us. Members, on Friday, July 30th, we will not be having a Rotary meeting due to the civic holiday. But as I'd mentioned earlier in our members exclusive segment, we do look forward to a very exciting Wednesday evening. Now, this is going to be the graduating class of 2020-2021 new members team, and they are going for gold for Olympics. So do join us at 5.30 p.m. on Wednesday. Now, uh, they, they do have a wonderful agenda planned, and I, and I also understand they have some suggestions for cocktails and mocktails. So with that note, let's cherish and continue to enjoy our nature, be it our yards, our balconies, our views, our streets, our lakes, our cottages. But of course, as we're coming out of COVID and getting back together, be safe and have a wonderful weekend. This meeting is adjourned.